Hi again. Okay, uh, we're now going to be talking about uh, moving into uh, chapter 11. And uh, I want to just give a little bit of um, uh, a, a primer to what, where we're going to go with this. Now, we've seen uh, the development of humans, the spread of humans throughout the world, uh, and then we've now looked at the, the shift from hunting and gathering, mobile uh, groups of people moving around in the landscape, responding to uh, environmental pressures, uh, and a shift into sedentism, people settling down in, in places and living their lives in one place. Villages, the growth of villages and larger communities, and the controlling of the environment. They're not just building a house and a home, but they're building an environment for themselves to live in, which includes uh, domesticated plants and animals. Now, this, I've argued, is an extremely, uh, this Neolithic revolution or agricultural revolution is, is an extremely important event, even though it took place in multiple places throughout the world at different times. It's a phenomenon that when it took place, it set up a new trajectory for people um, that uh, for 180 or 90,000 years, people, uh, humans around the world were, uh, were, were living a hunting and gathering lifestyle. And uh, in the past 10 to 15,000 years, we started to change that. And sedentism and the manipulation of the environment and plants and animals uh, bending those factors uh, to our will uh, created a shift in the brain and this maybe didn't affect the architecture of our brain but it, it, it affected our cosmology the way that we viewed the world and our relationship to it we talked a little bit about that when uh, I mentioned uh, the, the birth of religions, uh, naissance de divinité, naissance de l'agriculture, the birth of the gods, birth of agriculture uh, that Jacques Covin and Trevor Watkins uh, talked about, the origin of house and home, that restructuring your relationship to the world and your environment and creating a sense of domination over it, uh, it creates a new hierarchy. You don't just live in the world, you dominate over it. You're better than animals, you're better than plants. But does that mean someone's better than you? Someone's in charge of you? Uh, well, I'd like to take us back to um, uh, an earlier chapter when we talked about um, mechanisms of change. I had a supplementary um, uh, in chapter two, I had a supplementary presentation where I talked about um, not just how uh, archaeological theory ap approaches the past, but how it approaches the concept of how, thing cha how things change in the past. Um, and this is a challenge for archaeologists, not just to say, all right, here's the way things were, here's the way things uh, were organized in the past, but also why did they move in a particular direction? Why were they why was it com complexity increasing? Why, uh, why was, uh, were things like, um, why was writing invented? Why were social classes created? Why were there leaders and kings and queens and uh, the poor and the disenfranchised and the powerful and the weak? Why were these things, and were they inevitable? Has it always been the case? Well, probably not. Um, if you look at hunting and gathering societies, uh, there's equality. We even describe them as egalitarian societies, meaning that everybody can do pretty much everything that you need to do. Nobody has uh, um, outsized importance or domination over one another. If you say, I'm going to restrict your access to food, you'll say, take a hike, I'm gonna go get my own food. I can do that just as well as you can. But imagine that a government told you, you can't get food. 
what would you do? What would your recourse be in that case? You live in a complex society with division of labor. Do you produce your own food? Do you grow your own crops and uh, herd your own animals and milk your own cows and, uh, and get your own leather products and tan hides and uh, weave cloth and everything that you need to do, <laughs> build your own cars, uh, manufacture parts to make the cars that you have to build, to build, or you build your own house and structure. Of course you don't. You, you, you don't have the capability to do everything that you've got in this world. We divide those tasks up. Now, that means that if there is a controlling mechanism, they can restrict access to some of these things. There, there are, we live in a society that has um, a hierarchy. And this has an origin point. This didn't always exist. It's pretty common on this planet these days. Humans have created hierarchical, hierarchical societies all over the world. But why did that take place? And how did that, that take place? And how can we look at the archaeological evidence to understand the uh, the scenarios where that took place. Now, where I'm getting at here is uh, another one of Gordon Child's uh, hypothetical revolutions, as he called them. So we talked about the Neolithic Revolution or the Agricultural Revolution. We've already talked about that and how it took place in multiple places around the world. Well, the next of his revolutions uh, is, is another um, uh, an important event arguably as important as the Neolithic Revolution. You might argue for or against that, but in any case, it is another big change, a big moment in, in human past. And it's actually where we're going to end because uh, um, we're not going to move beyond that. Uh, it's a big enough subject, however, that we're going to break this down into a series of um, regions where we're going to examine cultures that went through the so-called urban revolution, this next event, um, very carefully region by region, just as we did with the Neolithic uh, revolution. So this urban revolution took place where uh, the pre-requisite um, for the urban revolution is this sedentary food producing society you have to have a number of factors uh, and, uh, that, that exist. And in fact, um, uh, this is the, um, what your, uh, the subject matter of your term paper that I'm assigning to you is about, is the concept of the urban revolution as Gordon Child described it. Um, he, we, we now tend to call this state-level society. Uh, that is the moving, moving from a smaller scale, uh, less complex social organization into a complex stratified hierarchical society, what we would call state level, a state, that is to say. So you don't just live in a village or community, you live in a sort of a regional area that has uh, multiple dependent communities and a hierarchy of dependent social classes. Um, and Gordon Child, uh, he, he was trying to get to the heart of what this meant and how, importantly, archaeologists could recognize this from the past. If you look at an assemblage that you get from an archaeological excavation or survey area, how do you know with, that what you're looking at is a village or a city? How do you know that it is a um, a just a local identity or a state level identity how do you know that you're you've had the urban revolution take place and he came up with a list of 10 uh, criteria that can be used sort of like a, a checklist and some of them are have been uh, other researchers have come back and, and organized these into this list of 10 things into primary and secondary categories. And the, th what that really means, primary and secondary, is that uh, five of those characteristics are 
sort of precursors to the uh, essential elements to um, being a state. And the other five are sort of symptoms of that happen once you are a state. And the other thing to keep in mind here are the, is that these 10 criteria, list of criteria, I think we've come to the realization that Gordon Child, while producing a useful list, may, th these may not all be requirements for us to say, okay, it's not a state because all 10 don't exist. Well, there might be some variants of uh, urban, complex urban communities, cultures that we could might call state level societies that don't have all of these things. So for instance, writing. Uh, does Do you have to have writing to be considered a state? Well, some would argue yes, some would argue no. But the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, this list of 10 criteria uh, is not necessarily one that you have to agree with every single point here. So let me go through this list for you. Dense, densely populated cities. This seems to be one of the primary things. You've got to have a city, something that has a densely populated urban area. That's why Gordon Child called it the urban revolution, in fact. And this means that the, the reason why this is so important is because if you live in a city, that means you're not doing everything that you might be doing if you're living in a small village. What I mean by that is is going to be uh, re, um, related to uh, the second point here, which is specialized full-time crafts, craftspeople and other specialized forms of employment. That's what we call division of labor. So we live in this society. Uh, I live in a city, but it also means that I have a specialized form of employment, but everybody does. No one who lives in this city does everything from top to bottom all by themselves. Nobody is self-sufficient. We divide up the labor into tasks and all of those tasks are organized under some sort of a uh, rules and regulations and government. Um, and that's, quite, that's category number five, of, uh, as I have listed here, which is ruling class of officials, political leaders, and priesthood. Now, priesthood is something that it's an official belief system, but also you have an official governmental structure and laws and legal system, political leaders. This is all a top-down hierarchical organization. And so you can be build a building, right? But it has to be to code. And you have to know who to punish and who to go after if it's built improperly. If you pay somebody uh, out of your uh, pro product that, uh, you know, I grow crops, I'm going to give you some of my crops uh, if you build my house for me because I don't have the time to do it because I'm growing my crops. If you don't do it well, who do I go to? Well, there is a specialized person who determines who's at fault, how you're punished, and uh, what the compensation is. Um, also, the means of subsistence is reliant upon there being more produced by agriculture and uh, animal husbandry than you have in a hand-to-mouth situation. Now this creates surpluses and this has to be organized somehow. So if you live in a sedentary community that produces their food uh, through agriculture or um, animal rearing, that means that you have, uh, you're not, you don't have the ability to go hunt and gather at any given time and fill up your food supply. You don't wake up every morning and then go find your food. The food has to be pre-planned and it has to be organized and it has to be specialized. And so does the harvest. The harvest has to be secured and stored and somebody will have the key to that storeroom. Because if you just want, said, I'm going to go get some food and clean out the storeroom, then there won't be enough for everybody else. And then the city starves. So there are rules and regulations about not just 
uh, where and how things get stored, the surplus product uh, of all kinds, not just agriculture, but who has access to that, differential access to resources. So that's number three, concentration of surplus goods. Um, and political organization, who is in charge of these keys to the storeroom and who determines what job people have and where you are ranked in society is not based on, um, on what family you're born into, but it's based on the fact that you are a citizen of that community. And there is opportunity for uh, rising up through the ranks, perhaps some type of social mobility. That's not always the case, um, but things like training, uh, or um, entrepreneurship, or um, um, skills. So a scribe is good at scribal activities. A warrior is good at being a warrior. A, um, an architect is good at being an architect. And these sort of things can be narrowed by families and kinship ties and that sort of thing. But uh, the, the primary political organization is based on your residence. You are, your identity is formed by being a resident, by being a citizen. That doesn't mean that you're no longer part of a family because there are different identities within that citizenship but these are nested within now what can be considered a larger identity that consumes all of these other smaller pockets that had existed as large entities before. So now you're not just this family member, you are this family member within the larger identity of this citizenry, right? Which has other families in it as well. So those are sort of the, the primary categories, densely populated citizens, uh, division of labor, con concentration of surplus, uh, ruling class of officials, political leaders, and priesthood, which is to say um, uh, a hierarchical system, and that that hierarchical system is based, uh, includes a, uh, an identity that reflects state-level identity, right? Uh, statehood and residence and citizenship. There are, of course, some other things that are perhaps easier to spot, but are sort of secondary. Once you're a state, this is what the state produces. And that is to say things like monumental architecture. Monumental architecture is not a cause of statehood, but a lot of uh, states create these. And we're going to talk a, a little, a lot about uh, monumental architecture because uh, for a state identity, this, this, buying people buying into the idea of being a, a citizen of, a, of this community you need symbols you need something to relate to you need something that everybody can look at and say that's my flag that's what i relate to and this other person looks at it and says i also relate to that now that can be a flag sometimes it can be um some other kind of small scale symbol or it can be a pyramid or a palace or a temple it can be huge monumental things that are built that represent the power of what your community can build. Um, also, if you have all of these division of labor, all of this division of labor that's taking place, that you have this person doing this task and another task and another task and another task, everybody needs to eat, everybody needs to drink water, everybody needs to be able to do all of this. And so how do you organize it? We're going to look at some of the systems that people, uh, different communities invented to try and account for these things, literally accounting. It may sound a little bit boring, but the birth of bureaucracy is super important to human, uh, um, to the urban rev revolution. One of those accounting systems was the invention of writing. And so formal writing systems you start to see pop up in the context of the invention of the state and the city. Uh, you also have other kinds of formalized systems of understanding things like exact and predictive sciences. Uh, you also have formalized artistic styles that represent the state in terms of uh, arts and literature and, and aesthetics. 
And of course, you also have uh, the state when it exists as an entity, it means that it's no longer uh, a collection of little villages. It is a collection of villages within an identity that exists. So within that identity, that identity is responding to other emerging state level identities. And so you have co-development, which is really important, that uh, you don't have states emerging in vacuums. They're emerging in conjunction with other states that are also rising at that time. So you have Egypt and Mesopotamia and Anatolia and uh, Iran and uh, Syria. All of these things are sort of are, are creating state level identities at the same time. In Greece, you have city states that are uh, perhaps smaller scale, but uh, autonomous units, but that are emerging an, an identity uh, both in op opposition with one another, but also as a Greek identity that is in a op opposition to something like Persia. We're not really going to talk about that. That's a bit late. But in any case, uh, all of those five, which is uh, monumental architecture, formal writing systems, adapt uh, exact and predictive sciences, uh, formalized artistic style and regular long distance trade seems to be meta phenomena, things that take place once you have a state established. These are some of the things that you would expect to see the state producing. And so the first five are sort of causal cause of states uh, or something that builds up towards states. And the second five that I mentioned are uh, more of the product of a state once it's established. And we're going to look at the various regions where we have seen state level identities emerge. This book doesn't cover them all uh, because uh, we have emerging states even happening to this day um, and in more recent times. Um, but as I mentioned in the first chapter, the difference between prehistory and history is writing. Uh, once you have written documents, then you're in historical periods. And so this book sort of causes a, a, a or chooses a, a, a cutoff point that we're only looking at prehistory into early proto-history. And so uh, we're not going to look at the emergence of secondary states like Greece and Rome or Persia, because these are things that have all emerged after the model of what a state is um, uh, has been established. So what we're going to be looking at are what are called primary states. That is to say, communities that emerged into complex urban state-level societies where no, none had ever existed before. Kind of like with the Neolithic Revolution,